All right, welcome to class. I am uh, Professor Nemirov. This is an introduction to the history of Western art uh, from the Renaissance to the present. What I'd like to do uh, first is to just show you a little bit about the, uh, of the art that we will be looking at between now and uh, early December. Um, I'm going to begin with that today for sure, but on Wednesday we'll be looking at uh, uh, very early 14th century, Giotto's um, Arena Chapel in Padua. Uh, already this Friday we will have moved up to the very early years of the 15th century in Florence, looking at uh, Masaccio's expulsion of Adam and Eve. And then we will go next Monday, a week from today, to up north for our first trip outside of Italy to northern Europe and look at um, Flemish painting, the development of oil paint, oil painting uh, in Flanders, 1430s, Roger van der Weyden's Descent from the Cross. We'll then switch back to Italy for two lectures next week, both concerning works from the 1480s, so um, Giovanni Bellini's uh, St. Francis uh, in Ecstasy from 1481-82, and then also more famously, from the same year, really, 1482, um, Botticelli's Birth of Venus. And then, perhaps even more of a famous work of art, um, the following lecture will focus on painting in Florence in the early 16th century, and in particular, Leonardo's Mona Lisa will um, gather our attention as we try, lo and behold, to actually have something to say about works that would seem to defy anything we could say at this point. And then staying in Italy, but also switching back and forth between Italy and Northern Europe, we'll focus on uh, another famous set of paintings from early 16th century Europe. Um, Michelangelo's Sistine Ceiling, a detail of which is there on the left, the creation of Adam. And then from the same time, uh, but in the north, um, on the border of Germany and France, Matthias Grunewald's um, gory and intense, unforgettable Isenheim altarpiece, a detail of which is there on the right. Uh, staying in the early 16th century, which is this kind of mother load of um, intense painting, um, we will focus then for a lecture on Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights, which installed um, in the Prado Museum in Madrid continues to exert a fascination. It was, for example, the one picture that my 14-year-old daughter um, wanted a postcard of as we left amid the very thousands of paintings there. Moving up to the Middle of the 16th century, then there is Peter Bruegel, another Flemish painter whose um, picture just as busy, just as intense with activity as Bosch, but in a different way called the Netherlandish Proverbs from 1559 is on the screen there. Uh, and then we get to the 17th century, which when I was your age was always my favorite century of painting, and maybe it still is, Caravaggio and his um, conversion of Paul at one of the churches there in, um, in Florence um, or in Rome. And then Velazquez's um, Las Meninas from 1656 there, a painting some of you may know from reproduction. Also in the 17th century, but now going to the Netherlands or Holland, two um, huge painters uh, from that time. Rembrandt, whose anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp you see on the screen from 1632. And uh, Vermeer, who was a generation younger than Rembrandt, but whose precious lot of paintings, some 40 total that have come down to us, is perhaps headed by this picture that has a lot of popular cultural currency now, the uh, girl or the woman with the pearl earring. One lecture on the 18th century, um, which in some ways is the century that is beginning most to resemble our own world. Um, uh, 
Watson and the Shark by the American painter John Singleton Copley, uh, who was born in Boston but spent most of his career in London, um, detailing or commissioned by a man who lost part of his leg while swimming as a boy in Havana Harbor. And then to the early 19th century and what is called Romanticism, but as with all the things in this class, we'll try to give some very specific terms, um, some concrete ways of thinking about these sort of bland concepts like Romanticism. So with two lectures on Romanticism, Francisco Goya's 3rd of May from 1808, or 3rd of May 1808 from 1814, which kind of sets the modern tone of what a victim is, what an innocent is, what a person with a white shirt throwing up their hands, not as Christ, but Christ-like is. And then back to Germany and also in the early 19th century, uh, so going from Goya's Spain to the Germany of Caspar David Friedrich, who uh, invents these mystical pictures of solitary beings or groups of beings communing with a world so kind of misty and diaphanous as to seem almost unreal or ideal as opposed to real. From there we'll go up to the middle to late 19th century with three lectures um, dealing first with two French painters, Edouard Manet, uh, who was sort of um, kin and friendly with the Impressionists in Paris, though not really an Impressionist himself, to consider how something that is fundamental for us in this class, which is the, the division between uh, high art, avant-garde art, and kind of popular culture, uh, info, entertainment, et cetera, begins to emerge. So Manet's painting comes from that time on the high art side. Um, his friend Bert Morisot, who's painting the harbor at Lorient, is an Impressionist proper, and we'll consider what it is about Impressionism that might um, you know, stimulate our regard, make it a matter of some consequence, as in fact every single painting in this whole course is, I think, designed to do. And then to the very end of the 19th century, the mystical, somber, but just absolutely beautiful paintings of Edvard Munch, uh, who is most famous for his painting The Shriek or The Scream, but we, in an impeccably high-minded manner, will simply ignore that famous painting and concentrate on something more difficult but also more local because this painting is in Los Angeles at the Getty and it's called Starry Night. And then finally, just around Thanksgiving, we'll emerge into the 20th century, um, focusing on the first decade of the 20th century, a tandem uh, of paintings very related to one another, one by Picasso on the left of vamping prostitutes in Barcelona, the Demoiselle d'Avignon, and then on the right, Matisse, his great rival and friend, um, his bathers with a turtle on the right. So modernity, um, a term you hear in your courses, this, we'll begin to think about that as pictures like this give us some of our terms for what that might mean. The First World War, whose 100 year anniversary is this year, and in fact during the course it will be the 100 year anniversary of the end of World War I on November 11th. Um, the beginnings of plastic surgery coming about because of all the horrific face, facial wounds, survivable facial wounds from that conflict, um, will be our focus as they relate to art and is in fact is some, via something you might or my, my, I might take for granted when it comes to paintings or photographs, et cetera, which is the human face and its, its power, um, almost mystical power. So this is by a British artist named Henry Tonks, one of many watercolors he did of uh, uh, people with grievous facial wounds from the First World War. The Second World War, we'll look at the work of Sh Charlotte Solomon, who was a German-Jewish uh, young woman who during the early years of the Second World War made, a, I guess you'd say, like an atlas, an autobiography, consisting of about 750 pictures that told her life story in full. Is it life or is it theater? We're then going to jump ahead to the 1980s in New York, a kind of wicked, nasty, dark, 
time, which out of uh, some kind of masochism I insist on revisiting in a lecture, and we'll focus on uh, the artists who came up big then, uh, notably um, Jean-Michel Basquiat, uh, one of whose paintings you see here called Hollywood Africans. Then we're going to do something which actually no previous version of this class has featured, which is there is a mandatory film screening of a new HBO film, uh, which is about the art world now in New York. It's just being released this fall uh, at theaters and also on HBO called The Price of Everything. That's going to be a special Tuesday night event here in this room on December 4th, followed the next day by a discussion between me and the director, Nathaniel Kahn, who is there on the right. And then we'll close it down. The last lecture will be about art that's been made in this decade. Many examples to choose from. But, you know, as a kind of diploma piece for the, the class, we'll look at Dolores Salcedo's uh, work here, A Flor de Pie. It's called um, just a 21 by 35 foot carpet, I guess you could call it, of roses preserved in chemicals and sewn penitentially together. There's a detail on the right of the sewing by the artist, all in commemoration of a nurse in her country, her native country, Colombia, who was abducted, raped, killed, and uh, dismembered by a uh, drug cartel. You will be able to make sense of that, by the way. Just so you, I'm not the most confident person, but I'm just telling you, you will. So. Um, <coughs> Art is, is going to stop being like, oh, that's cool. It's going to stop being that, I hope, I think, uh, in this course. So I've given you a bit of a sense of the what. Um, you know, this, this is the what. But I want to say something here with this slide on the screen about just how daunting it actually is to go into a museum. Leaving aside the fatigue, which seems inevitably to set upon even me, when I step in. You come into a gallery like this in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, it's, it can be enticing, yes, but it can also be alienating. If you look at, say, this picture here, you know, coming up to it, I mean, what, how, how are we supposed to relate to this in anything other than a kind of dutiful, conscientious way? Read the label, understand something. Um, and this makes me think about what the focus of the course is and what the focus of today's lecture is in particular, which is the past and the present. And you might just say, well, OK, right, the past and the present. Um, they have very kind of banal connotations, don't they? They're, the past is, yes, there was a past. Yes, this work here ha uh, was painted 700 years ago. Yes, and there's a present like, what's happening in the news today. But I don't really, I'm not so concerned about those things. You know, yes, there is memorization. Yes, there is, um, you know, uh, this painting was painted in 1308, this one in 1612. But that's not the, the fundamental stakes of the course. And the same notion of the present, like what's happening in the news today, also not. I'm playing for larger stakes, and I'm playing for myself, too, about these terms. The past, to me, um, the way I would describe it is this course is about the otherness of the past. Like, it's not, it's not just over there, some interesting stuff happened. It's about how profoundly foreign it is. The past is a foreign country. And the present, I was thinking of the right term. I would just call it the glow of the present what is sometimes referred to as being in the moment, which we all glibly pay tribute to as a phrase. However, I would like to say that um, that's one of the beautiful things about being alive, to uh, be in that glow of the present. And I'm proposing that works of art are one of the places where we can experience that glow and consequently feel most alive. And with this picture, then, I want to now look at it actually filling the screen, and for those of you who have the slide sheet, this is then the first work at the top of your sheet, um, those being the most important works, the other ones being uh, supporting works. When I say most important, I mean those are the ones, these are the ones that could be on the midterm on October 26th or the final exam on December 13th. You'll notice that there's a precious few of them. Uh, 
the lectures will always be about only a few uh, main works of art. In any case, this is painted in the city of Siena, S-I-E-N-A, bottom of your sheet term there, by the artist Duccio, who was active from about 1278 to 1318, so long ago. Imagine yourself again coming to this place, like what beyond an obligatory sense are we supposed to make of it? But let's go in, and I'll just say the first thing about the otherness of the past here, as you look at this work, which is just including the frame, the size of the sheet of paper you're writing on, so tiny, is that it's not a work of art. So that term we use, oh, I'm taking the history of art, this works of art, it's a, that's not right. That's not, there was no work of art in early 14th century Siena. And what do I mean by that? Do I mean it's not good enough to be a work of art? No, that's not what I mean. What I mean is this is like a religious object with a religious purpose. Do you see these kind of scallops at the bottom of it that are kind of charred a little bit? And you, you might guess what those are from. They're from candles. So you have to imagine over centuries, really, people burning candles in front of this work, which is so small, so it invites you to imagine a very personal, it's for one person, right? Uh, works of art, whatever they are, are not that. This is a religious object, like a, you could say a votive object, V-O-T-I-V-E. And what would those candles do to that gold background? You could imagine they would, as my colleague Bissara Pancheva writes about and lectures about, they would glitter, they would, that gold background would shine. This is all denatured if you, when you see this in the museum, but because they're not gonna light a candle in front of it, but that's what it would be. And what's the effect of that? It's that this thing, this little thing, is this concentrated nugget of intense experience for the person who was contemplating it back then. Um, and it's, if I could use the word, alive. You know, it's, it's got a kind of pulsating, heart-beating feeling. It's an active object. It doesn't take much imagination in, in the museum to kind of come around to that idea. Wow, once upon a time this meant something. Now, if there wasn't a work of art, then if there were only religious objects, and let's put what work of art is over to the side. We'll get to that in the course. Well, were there artists? And I would say, mm, I would say no. I would call Duccio a painter, trying my best to find the right term. So what's the difference between a painter and an artist? A painter would be someone who is very skilled at bringing forth objects for a dedicated purpose, again, a religious purpose. And does that mean, well, then he is a hack or just a carpenter, basically? No, I think Duccio is rightly celebrated as an innovator who sets us on the track for uh, who we are and how we are now. And how is that? Well, if you look at a comparison on the screen between the painting on the left we've been talking about and now one on the right, which is called the Madonna of the Big Eyes, so just a colloquial name, which is from Siena. It's at the bottom of your sheet. <clears throat> I think you can begin to see the differences. So this picture on the right is from the, around 1220, so almost a full century before the Duccio. The picture on the right is uh, the Madonna and Child are full frontal. They are uh, iconic. They, they are just presenting themselves in this kind of de declarative um, gesture that is um, basically beyond time and space, is separate from you. Intimate is not a word I would use about the work on the right. Even if we discount for it being a much bigger work, like 50 inches tall, let's still say it is remote. What Duccio does is he, I would say, humanizes or personalizes the gestures on the left. 
whatever the Christ child is doing. He's kind of, this is a, a, a gesture of immense delicacy of just <laughs> lifting that little veil back. The virgin's face is sad because she's contemplating the fate of her son, the eventual fate of her son who will uh, die on the cross at 33. And their exchange of gazes is sad. I think it's also about a word that we throw around or which Duccio and others of his time, like Dante, the poet, are inventing then, which is the word love. I, um, there's human closeness in their relationship. The, the queen of heaven, the mother of <coughs> Jesus, is personalized in a way, not made just like one of us, but there's something, as my daughters would say, relatable. And so... This is emphasized by how personal the picture is in relation to us, too. One of the things people say about paintings like this, both of them really, is that they have no space, really, no illusionistic space. Maybe there's just a tad of it here in this kind of like, uh, you know, architectural element here, but really they don't. It's just all that gold background. What that means is the space spills forward in each. It invites you to imagine not a scene in the picture, but the scene in front of the picture. And who is the person in front of the picture? It's some worshiper. Um, with this one especially, think about that. It's part of a unit. That's like part A. And then sure as like Siamese twins, there's a part B and it's the person in front of it. The person lighting the candle. We're suddenly in a very intense, animated, human, uh, kind of disarmingly gentle and sad um, connection with religious mystery here. The term work of art, again, whatever that means, is not appropriate for it. Duccio, as a measure of his importance then and there, and as a way for us to continue to test this idea of the otherness of the past, makes then a huge painting so the opposite of the 8 by 10 inch painting we just looked at, which is the second one at the top of your sheet called the Maesta, or the Majesty, the, um, the Virgin enthroned there in the center. How big is this picture? It is uh, 7 feet high, 13 feet wide. And like all of uh, Duccio's paintings, it's painted on wood, on poplar wood. It's actually 11 vertical boards in the front like that that are glued together. Then they, there's a linen that is stretched over them. That's a, a material made of animal glue called gesso, G-E-S-S-O, -S -S is put on there. You get an incredibly smooth, like chalky, chalk, sleek, white surface to paint on. Then with tempera, with egg-based pigments, he goes in. This commission, the Maesta, so big, took him three years, 1308 to 11, him and his assistants to do. Just to give you a sense of the scale, that's probably not even quite right, but you get the idea. The same things about <clears throat> figuring forth a space in front of the picture as much as in it hold true for this painting, which is again not a work of art. And what do I mean by that? Well, the Maesta, as you can extrapolate from its size, and here is uh, a group of people in a recent ceremony in Siena carting not the thing itself, but a replica, like a digital replica, but in real wood, into a cathedral. Uh, the Maesta was huge, even bigger than what we just saw. Originally, it had uh, these pinnacles at the top made out of wood by a carpenter shop as a prep for Duccio. And then at the bottom, this strip of scenes, which is called a predella, at the bottom of your sheet. And uh, so it was even bigger than that 7 by 13 feet. And in the church of, um, in Siena Cathedral, it was at the high altar. And 
this picture, which is not by Duccio and comes from later and is just at the bottom of your sheet. It's a kind of incidental picture, which you can use Sherlock Holmes style to deduce some things about a now um, changed environment, shows two things of interest to us. Notice it's at the bottom. It's the presentation of the keys to uh, the Virgin, 1483. One is up in the foreground, these um, religious dignitaries are presenting the keys to the city to an icon of the Virgin Mary, who is the patron saint of Siena. And notice how, in, that, in the spirit of that idea of animation, she is actually no longer a picture, but is reaching down animistically, supernaturally, to receive the keys. Second thing, related to the Maesta, do you see this here, back here? That's, this is the only surviving representation of how the Maesta existed in Siena Cathedral at the high altar uh, before it was removed from there in 1506. So what we are dealing with, as I show you now a photograph from the modern day of that distinctive zebra-striped cathedral that was begun in 1215 and finished in 1338, just imagine the maesta there at the front. It's not there now. And think about the way it needs to control, or should I say dominate, the space in front of it. It needs to be legible, clear, pulsating, pounding, forward so every last parishioner, even the ones in the back row, can, can make it out. This, in other words, is just a kind of supersized uh, religious artifact of the kind we've seen a minuscule version of to start. And just so you can correlate, you see these differently patterned columns near the high altar. Those are the same there. So again, this modern day reenactment by people in blue jeans, et cetera, is at least somewhat useful for giving us a sense of um, the absolute religious purpose of, of this thing. And here's another word you can add on to that too, which is a strange word because we don't deal in this stuff anymore, I don't think. It's the word totality. So we, we rightly put a lot of negative terms on that totality, like a totalizing system or a totalitarian, but I think it's also possible to think of like a complete total environment in which every last detail hangs together. Any of you who've read a novel cover to cover and, and just marvel at how each scene, each sentence is completely locked into everything else. Anyone who's ever seen a movie where you just cannot believe that the actress, let's say, is, this, is, is on point in character from beginning to end, are, you're praising a kind of total, totalizing performance. So at Siena Cathedral, the maesta is not just like a thing over there in the midst of a bunch of other things. You see this uh, throne the Virgin is on. It's got that very distinctive architecture. To me, it really connects with the pulpit by the sculptor Nicola Pisano, whose name is at the bottom of your sheet, a pulpit that went up just uh, in 1265 to 68. If we come back to the over, overview, there is the pulpit. And then you see this window here. So you've got this relationship here where the preacher preaches from is absolutely like locked into the organic architecture and visionary pulsation of the painting at the front, at the high altar. But also that window up here, which you see now in close up, which shows the death of the Virgin, the assumption of the Virgin, and then the coronation of the Virgin in heaven. What I'm making a case for is when you walk into that place, or even just right now, you are experiencing the absolute relatedness of one thing to another, to another, to another, and not just for pleasing aesthetic effect, right, but there is, you know, there's basically two things, right? There's chaos or cosmos. There's anarchy, um, lack of structure, and then there's some, no matter how mythic, there is, there is like something where every, a system where everything hangs together. 
this church then would be one such. And here you might say, why? If that church is so vast, why would, let's say, Duccio paint the Virgin's face with such care? Yes, of course, for the small picture we started off looking at, yes, of course. But why in a picture, in a, in a painting that's not going to be legible from 100 yards away, no one's going to see, see that face like that. Sure, they, might, they need to know it's the Madonna, but that's fine. And here's my word for that, which is somewhat related to totality. It would be, be the word belief. And talk about the otherness of the past, because belief is not something that comes to us quite as easily here. Faith, you might say. And what do I mean by that? Well, here's how I would put it. I would say, if you look at Jesus' face in the Maesta, it's again, you could take the analogy of an actress or an actor. If, they're, if, they, if they take one scene off and the director's not paying attention, the whole illusion is ruined, right? The whole totality of the movie is ruined. So if you're Duccio, just like you are, if you're any kind of painter or serious person interested in creating a total vision, everything has to be of the same ambiance, the same environment, this kind of saturated sadness, which is brought to life via the kind of smoky shadow and light of the faces. There's John the Baptist, who's one of the saints off to the side in the Maesta. You cannot, there's no such thing as a minor character. Any one of you who is a writer already, and this is St. Agnes, so if way off to the side, Someone probably, only one in 1,000 of the visitors to the museum where this painting is now would even take a glance at. But she, for that close-up, needs to be absolutely secure, persuasive, believable in her separate identity. You know, any one of you as a writer, you would know, like, well, there's a scene where um, it just is not persuasive. Or you can't bring the same mojo to it and your reader loses interest. I mean, these are questions of what it is to make something, to make a world, to make a totality, to make, to believe in something. And this belief has to be, extend in Duccio Siena beyond the walls of the cathedral. You might say, well, you could take a deep breath as soon as you're outside of that sanctified environment, but no, this, the Virgin is the patron saint of the whole city. And in this 2015 event, the a replica of the Maesta was brought forth um, through the city streets in duplication of the event on June 9th, 1311, when the actual Maesta was brought through the streets of Siena. Bells ringing, music playing, church and political dignitaries leading and following the icon, the religious object. It has a kind of smoldering intensity for the whole city. Maybe somewhere like 10 miles outside the city, the little blades of grass go to sleep because they feel they're no longer in the magnetizing pull of this thing on the altar of the cathedral. But Everything else is drawn like shavings to a magnet. And so if you look at the Siena Cathedral here in an aerial shot, one way to demonstrate this is to look at it in relation to the other big civic building there, which is the City Hall, or the, it's called the Palazzo Publico. Uh, both buildings still standing to this day. The Palazzo Publico from 1288 to 1309, so right in those same years. And here it is now with the distinctive um, plaza in front of it. I'm going to take you inside the Palazzo Publico to show you the space of Siena that the believing, totalizing image and the artist who created it need to uh, embrace, okay? Uh, and I guess the ethical question is here, like, how do we make such things now? 
or do we? So inside the Palazzo Publico are several frescoes by a later artist from Duccio. Duccio died in 1318, but this artist, who's the other one at the top of your sheet, named Ambrogio Lorenzetti. And what, the, what these are, they're in a technique called fresco, which I will explain more on Wednesday. But the so fresco is painting directly on the wall, on the wet plaster. But in this room, which is basically where the city leaders of Siena met, I'm going to take you into this scene. So it's a different tonality of the slide, but what we're looking at is this scene, which is the work at the top of your sheet from 1338-39, the allegory of good government. So what this shows is, um, well, a city run properly. A, um, if this were Stanford, it would be people riding their bikes and um, going to Treseder and so on. It would be just a kind of consistent portrayal of all the different things that happen on a given day. No pretense to realism, but just symbolically showing how good government makes a city run smoothly. Um, just as a sign of that there's no realism here, you would never have seen uh, a, dan uh, a sort of troupe of uh, young women dancing hand in hand through the streets, they are meant to symbolize the properties I've just been speaking of. But there are many trades here. For example, let's see, um, up here, uh, men working on the roof. Um, down at ground level, you know, making shoes. Nothing is too small uh, not to be shown, to, to be shown. And what you have to say if you imagine the Virgin's face and indeed the Maesta over all of this is that from the point of view of the ideology, the belief of Siena, uh, it's all consecrated. There's no meaningless gesture in the world. There's no trivial gesture in the world. So if you go to the city gates, one of which you see here, the so-called Porta Romana, which is on the south side of the city and leads down in the direction of Rome, you see a number of things here. One of which is the figure, this allegorical figure here, uh, holding up a sign, a, a banner, as well as a scaffold from which hangs one victim. This is the figure of Securitas, which I put at the bottom of your sheet, meaning basically security or homeland security there at the gates to symbolize that, yes, part of the good government consists in punishing offenders and so on. And this is, if you like, a kind of secular counterpart to the Virgin Mary. But leaving her aside, thinking about, you know, the prosperity and kind of peaceful cohabitation of different classes of society. Look at the people coming out of the gate here. These are, I think you can see it even in the back, these are well-to-do people, like a, lo a lord and a lord's uh, going um, hunting, going hawking. There are dogs here. Even as a peasant comes up through here with a sizable pig on its way to market. Um, the peaceful sphere of Siena extends out into the countryside, which is part of its property, its domain. In the Italian word, it's called the cantado at the bottom of your sheet. This is what I mean about this kind of radiance or radius of prosperity and peacefulness. Of course, it's a dream. It's a fantasy. Siena was at war with its neighbor Florence quite often, for example. But, and of course, this is propaganda. It's right there in that City Hall um, main room. However, as a dream, it's, it's enticing, it's intoxicating, um, and it suggests um, the unities of a world right down to the last bristle on, the, on this pig um, and right up to like the, the, no, the nobility of the architecture, etc., made possible by belief, by a kind of um, conviction in who one is and what one's city is. 
And these religious objects play a key role in that. What's striking about this, when you see this in Siena, or even right now, poignantly, is that it all went down the drain. 1348, so nine years after this was painted, um, the bubonic plague hit much of Europe, um, the Black Death, as it was called, um, in Siena. In the summer of 1348, well, 27,000 of the 42,000 inhabitants died that summer. It's funny about Ambrogio Lorenzetti, there is no record of him after 1348. So you may draw your own conclusions, but it's assumed that he, uh, as well as his brother Pietro, um, who were really the leading painters in Siena at that time, both perished. The otherness of the past. I'm just going to emphasize it with all my little paltry melodrama here. These things are, I mean, part of the, the, the power of them is they're just coming from beyond. It's very easy. It's easy for me to just look and say, oh, that's from, uh, oh, that's from that date. You know, part of life is just memorizing stuff and thinking about stuff. But really, if you think about it, it's the otherness of the past. Everything we've been looking at comes from the far side, if you like, the wrong side of the bubonic plague. It's like pieces of space junk that fall down from the sky and land. It's like some weird thing. That's what every painting from the deep past is in a museum. And the Maesta is its own kind of uh, junk, let me say. And what I mean by that is, apart from whatever social cataclysms, catastrophes, etc., happen, works of art are themselves like things that come down from the deep past and get damaged, disrupted, changed, en route. So you're probably saying, well, I get this on the right, the tonality is different, but I recognize that this is the maesta, um, you know, with now kind of magically put together again with its missing pinnacle and predella. But what's this on the left? It matches the maesta. Well, in fact, it's the back side of the maesta, which I have not shown you. So on a whole separate part, a uh, separate group of poplar planks, um, five glued horizontally. Duccio and his assistants painted a whole other set of scenes. The front and back were glued together. And here is now what remains of the back, which is 26 scenes showing different uh, moments from the life of Christ, more particularly the passion of Christ, which is the last days of his mortal life. And so, for example, if you look at these two here, we'll have cause to come to know these scenes. Part of the history of art is just recognizing the scenes. This is called the agony in the garden, where Jesus appears uh, not once, but twice to say, to, to pray on the, on the mount, but also to invite three of his apostles to come there. And they actually end up falling asleep, whereupon he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Um, this is just one of those scenes. This is, again, we're right here. And then right above is the scene right after it where Ju uh, Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss, leads the soldiers right to him. The apostles, these apostles flee, etc. This is for the backside of the maesta. It's where the priests would study. It's, it's small, consequently. So you might be saying, well, okay, this is interesting. Now that my, I know the maesta is part, has a front and a back, but how does this relate to the otherness of the past and how our objects come down from us from the past? Well, if you look at a reconstruction just in black and white of how the back of the maesta might have looked, Notice that it had a predella too. And this predella just disappeared. In 1711, so 400 years after Duccio painted this, it was decided for unknown reasons to split, to saw the front from the back, to like split it lengthwise. 
which was hard to do, and they messed it up in doing that. But in any case, and then other parts just went vanished at that point, or vanished and then reappeared in disparate locations. So a lesson to the museum goer, right? You, you and me, um, you see this one and this one and this one. Those are the three painting parts of the Maesta, which is this huge picture. You would call it a polyptic, like a, a many-pictured picture that are in the United States. They're all, how big are these? They're 17 by 18 inches. You go to the Frick Museum in New York, not far from the Metropolitan. There's Christ's Temptation on the Mountain, which is at the bottom of your sheet. It, it's, um, Jesus is resisting the devil's temptation. The devil is promising him all the kingdoms on earth, and he's saying, be gone. If you or I are looking at this picture, we're just thinking more or less, that's interesting. Um, but we maybe don't know that it is part of this huge other picture. It's like a fugitive, a refugee uh, from the painting it really belongs to. Works of art we study in museums are fragments from the past. Here's the picture that was probably right next to it on the predella of the backside of the Maesta. This is a beautiful painting uh, which could sustain a whole paper in this class very easily, I think, of Jesus recruiting the brothers, the fishermen brothers, Peter and Andrew, uh, to come away from their merely worldly and gravity-bound um, pursuits to something higher. And this painting is at the National Gallery in Washington. Again, you or I were walking through the museum. That's interesting. That's, I, I'm going to learn about that. We move on. But in fact, this is some like, piece of wreckage from the past. Or in Fort Worth, Texas, um, at the great museum, the Kimball Art Museum there, there is the Raising of Lazarus, also from the predella of the backside of the Maist, also at the bottom of your sheet, where Ma Lazarus has been dead four days. Mary and Martha, uh, his, his sisters, beseech Jesus to do something about it. The tomb, the heavy door from the tomb is lifted. And with the stench then... Um, coming out, Lazarus in his winding clothes, his shroud, awakes at Jesus' behest. It's a kind of allegory of what we do in this class, I think, which is to make dead things come alive, but also to respect their deadness in a way. They come from another time than ours. We have to think past the fact that, for example, with this picture, sometime in the 20th century, an overzealous um, conservator changed it somewhat. Because if you look at, if you really study this work, which is what this course is about, what, what is going on with this guy's hands? Like, OK, I believe this on the right. But what kind of like silly putty elastic hand does he have there? Did, du did Duccio take a day off? Well, you've already heard the professor say that this is not <laughs> how artists, real artists work. And actually, x-rays show that there was a second um, attendant whose face was there, I believe, who was just kind of painted out by a Harvard conservator sometime in the early 20th century. This is all part of the historical record for us. You know, works of art, um, they accrue associations. They are not just from 1311. They're from, in this case, 1936, too, whatever it is. They're historical records of different moments. Which brings us back last to these slides I asked you to think about in terms of your own visit to a museum and how daunting it can seem. And everything I've said really has been about the otherness of the past, but let me just close with a remark about the glow of the present. You look at this, the smoldering, or the, the, the sort of ashen remnants of the candles speak to how burned the past is. It's on fire. It's a time 
that prevent, presents us with a kind of ethical challenge. That was belief. And it's a kind of ruin we contemplate. But the glow of the past or the glow of the present, there's still something looking at this now where one can feel that this is not an ordinary object. It's not a television set. It's not even a tree waving in the wind on this campus. It's some kind of, this is the way I would describe it. It's like a concentration of experience. The past and a certain moment of present encounter for you is goldenly um, becoming visible, sensible to you as you look at it. And that's a tall order to think of. Well, I just wanted to go to the museum, but I'm asking you to think in this course about taking on board very much more radical notions of what the past is and also for all of us what the present is. Thank you.